Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. Mark, what should our listeners do to that subscribe button? Smash that subscribe button and leave lots of five-star reviews and refer us to your friends. <laughs> there we go. We're turning Eddie and Jobo. I love it. Yes. <laughs> so hey, I got to see you. I got to see you in person the other day. This was great. I know this will air a couple of weeks ago, but the time we're recording this, we just we just uh, finished up our our little live performance with uh, Windy City REI. And I know you, you you me know this, but I think it's kind of funny for the listeners. It's like that's probably you and me have probably seen each other in person less than ten times our, our entire life. For as much time as we spend t- together, and <laughs> people probably know us to be uh, like that that close. Like we've only seen each other less than ten times in person in real life. And we just started doing monthly dinners. So before that, like during COVID, I had seen you like four times. Like yeah, ever. no, not even that, man. It's crazy. So, uh, but yeah, no, what a great event that was. I mean, there was a great crowd, great, uh, great meetup they have. Yeah, no. So appreciate everyone who put that on. Um, I'm not going to name names. I know Chris and his crew, but I'm going to leave five people out because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But great event. Check it out. We have them on our webpage. They have an event every uh, once a month, every Sunday, Navigator Tap Room. Just a lot of good stuff. A lot of great guests. Uh, and they're they're booked up pretty much through like August or September with guests, so they're 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 cooking. Yeah, there's lots of that's it. All their guests very high um, high level of uh, information that you can get out of those, uh, except for us, of course. But uh, everybody everybody else that I've seen them bring on there every week, it's just they just they're they're really good at bringing good people in for their group. So you gotta check that group out. Yeah. What what else we got going on? We we ready for a housing provider tip of the week? Yep. Yep. And, and along those lines of uh, what we talked about actually at that group is right now inventory is, uh, is tight and you got a lot of people, you know, get into real estate, looking for cash flow. And I just want to point out right now, when you're evaluating deals, there's really five things that you can make money on in real estate, at least five top ones that uh, if you have a few of these in place, you're going to make money, even though it might not cash flow X amount of hundreds of dollars per month. So keep in mind, uh, you know, you got your appreciation, uh, you have your tax advantages, you know, talk to your CPA about your true tax advantages. I mean, sometimes on the surface, it's hard for us to really know what money we're saving uh, against our tax or our other earnings based on our write-offs. Principal pay down every month. You know, even if you're breaking even, you're still uh, losing uh, hundreds of dollars of that loan is getting paid down each month. And the longer that loan gets in, the, the more that principal is going down every month. Um, you know, inflation right now, you know, if you have cash in the bank, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's, you're actually going to probably lose money sitting there in the bank, getting, even if you're getting your half percent in your savings account. Um, and, and then of course, uh, appreciation's there. Um, I know people say don't bank on appreciation, but if, if you have a long-term hold strategy, uh, appreciation will be there, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, your properties will be more than they are today. Even if you go down in a, some sort of real estate cycle. Yeah. I think, you know, I always look at it almost just like the opportunity costs or what is the other thing I can do with, with the finances, right. You know, compared to something else. And does this still make sense given everything you just laid out there? It doesn't have to be this binary, like, Oh, the market's hot compared to two years ago. It's like saying like, I don't know. Why would that be your basis point? Two years ago has passed. You missed it. Like it's gone. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so the basis point is now like you have this, do you buy real estate or do you do something else? Or, you know, it, it's a now decision, not a now versus past decision. I am super excited about today's uh, guest. I've been talking with uh, him, you know, for I think it's about two or three years now we, we've been talking. I know it's just before COVID because I remember when I first spoke to him, I was out of town and, and that didn't happen for many years, I think, uh, with COVID. So um, today's guest, he's from Naperville. He's played in played football at University of Illinois, which Tom, I was Woo, texting, I was texting, I was texting Tom last night saying, oh man, you know where he's from? Uh, so He's on the UCLA Bowl team, no? We, you overlap. That's about your timeline, right? Craft, craft Fight Hunger Bowl champions. Let's get it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's go. We won that one. After graduation, he decided to declare for the NFL where he spent three years with the New York Giants, one year with Denver Broncos, and three years with the New England Patriots. Uh, he's currently a free agent going into his eighth NFL season. And throughout his career, he started investing in real estate from multifamily to single family. We're excited to hear kind of that transition uh, from one career into another. And uh, here today with us is La- Matt Lacoste. Matt, welcome. Awesome. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you for having me. Super excited. Did, did I get your, I didn't, I didn't dive into any stats or anything like that. Did I get your intro? Did, was it okay? <laughs> you killed the intro. There aren't many stats to talk about. So he killed the intro. I played on a couple teams. I've been in the league for a while. So I've been very fortunate. Um, and yeah, been diving into real estate ever since. That's awesome. So we're going to dive into a few different things here today, but 
the, the one thing that that really intrigues me is how one part of someone's life kind of translates into other parts of their life. And, you know, you've played sports your whole life and on the highest of competitive levels, uh, playing professional football in the NFL, but how have those skills and, and like drives motivate you in business to, uh, to, how does that translate to real estate investing for you so far? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about, I've made it to the highest of levels. Um, obviously NFL is the highest in professional football. So I guess it kind of motivates me to get to the highest levels of real estate. Now I haven't been able to put my full heart and everything into real estate because of obviously my professional job, but I think it's something that gives me an extra added motivation. It's something I'm used to is just trying to just not necessarily strive to be the best, but just strive to get to the top of whatever I'm working on. Got it. Well, let's, let's take a step back then. Just how did we get the real estate bug, right? Like you busy guy, right? I got to imagine you, you don't have a ton of time on your hands. How did this fall in your lap? Like what, let's start from there. Yeah. Um, pretty simple actually. Uh, went to university of Illinois, wasn't a great student, kind of just always thought like football was the path. If football doesn't work out. I'll figure out something. Unfortunately, football, fortunately football worked out and everyone just kept asking me, what are you going to do after football? What are you going to do after football? And I honestly didn't know. I had no idea or anything. All I know is that I didn't want to work for somebody once I was done in the NFL so just Googling around, seeing what I could do, um, stumbled upon bigger pockets, which I'm sure a ton of people have started reading their books, probably my third year in the league and just kept gaining my knowledge and everything. And then three years ago, felt comfortable enough to start investing in some multi a multi multifamily property and kind of just got the bug ever since and trying to expand in different areas and meet as many people as I can. So yeah, it just started with a, trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And fortunately I love it. You said something interesting. You, you knew you didn't want to work for somebody else. Not many people figure that out that early on. Like, what, what was it? There's a, did you have a, a parent yeah, that, that hated his boss? Like, how'd you get to that conclusion that early? It's super ironic. I hate being told what to do, even though I've spent eight, seven years of my life in the NFL being told what to do. Um, super ironic. But I just, just going into work every day and like having to like talk to like live up to somebody else's dreams and aspirations just didn't really sit well with me. Uh, so I think I just wanted to see what I could do on my own and try to create a team around me as well, which is what I'm currently trying to do. Uh, so I think that's where, where it uh, kind of came from. I just, I don't know. I just don't like being told what to do sometimes. Got it. So uh, let's, let's dissect the first investment, but before getting there, I, I am curious, just a little behind the curtains here, you know, when, when you're in the league, I, I know the NFL makes a huge deal about, you know, we have all these financial literacy classes. We want to teach these young men how to invest and how to, you know, was any of that of value or is that more very, very elementary for someone who maybe you know, never had any, you know, any guidance before? So it is better than it was when I was younger, but it is still not anywhere where it needs to be. It's super for these guys are 22 years old and they become instant millionaires. They, they get, some guys get 10 to, 10 to $15 million right off the bat, um, which is obviously a substantial amount of money for any of, but anybody, let alone a 22 year old. Uh, so it's super, super basic knowledge from the NFL, which these guys do need. And I need, I needed myself as well. I don't want to exclude myself, but it's not a continuing process. It's just pretty much your rookie year. You go to these classes and maybe your second year, you go to these classes and you learn the super basic information, how to open up a bank account and do all this stuff. But that's about it. And there are places for players to go to further their career development throughout the league, but it's something that the player has to take upon themselves to go search and, and do, which a lot of guys are so concentrated on playing football because that's where their money and that's where their mind's been all their life that they're not necessarily thinking life outside of football. If that makes sense. Yeah. It's crazy. It just seems so dangerous to me, right? Like, you know, I, I people say like, Oh, how can you go bankrupt? I, I could, I could absolutely see it. Like oh, if you never, okay. if you, if you, if you came from nothing and they never, that, that's all thrown at you and you're 22, you're not 35. No, oh, yeah. Mark, like, you know, I, I didn't know you when you were 22. I have seen pictures of you with frosted tips though. So I know. <laughs> oh, you're, you're a backstreet boy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, you know, it, man, it's just such a young time when like you shouldn't have $20 million in front of you. Like that's just oh. a recipe for disaster. Or even if you do have $20 million, figure out how to put it or who to, get a hire the right financial advisor. A thousand people in your ear all saying to do this, that, or the other. Yeah. yeah you just, have to realize a lot of guys are also, they're paying for a lot of people's lives. They're providing housing for family, food, shelter, automobile, multiple houses, insurance, all that stuff. And 
I think the hardest thing for a lot of people in the NFL is saying no to everyone in your ear. Um, it's better than what it used to be. Guys are a lot more educated now than back in 2015, which was my rookie year. But I think we still have a lot of uh, – we still have a long way to go. Cool. Go ahead, Mark. I, I imagine you just you, – the, the, the faucet, you, you when you're 22, 23, you just know that. You can go spend it because your justification is uh, I'll make more next year. Or I'll make more next – like it's, it's going to keep coming. And yeah. I imagine the, sharp, the, the harsh reality is when it just stops coming and then all of a sudden those bills don't stop coming. Exactly. <laughs> or that <laughs> lifestyle. Injuries happen. The NFL is a hundred percent injury rate guaranteed. You're going to get, injured. you're going to get injured eventually. It's going to happen. So just, it depends the severity and if you're prepared for it. Yep. All right. So let's talk about this first investment now. So one, I, I want to ask, why did you come back to Chicago land? Right. Nationally, everyone just, you know, everyone for lack of better words, craps all over us. It's a terrible place to invest. You can't make money here. Even though every week we put on someone on the show that is doing it here. Like we know that it works. But you were exposed to all different parts of the nation. Why Chicago? And then how are you able to just hone in on an area, right? Because you're not just sitting here like us in front of a computer all day, you know, you know, be, being able to readily go walk properties. Yeah. No, like I think first of all, I chose Chicago because I'm familiar with it. Chicago and the surrounding suburbs because I'm familiar with it. It's where I'm from. It's my home. And when people say you can't make money in Chicago, like you said, got so many people are doing it. Tons of people have made money, been profitable in the city and the surrounding suburbs. Are there te technically are there more profitable growing cities? Yes, but in some ways, I believe those are also diluted now and over invested in. So I still think Chicago and the surrounding suburbs is an awesome play. But that's kind of how I got my start. Just it's what I was familiar with. It's what I was comfortable with. Uh, I connected with Mark and I knew him in the area and kind of knew a couple people in the area. So I had some good lead like mentors and leaders in front of me that helped me make, feel comfortable making decisions. And honestly, that's how, that's how I got to it. I thought same thing you thought other people are doing it. I can do it too. Awesome. Is that now is your first purchase, the 10 unit? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I went all, that I went jumped all in. in. Nice. I went, I went all in is that, <laughs> I, right, that, so, that, that, that building's a story. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about it. Let's, let's hear the story. So we don't own anything. And we said, you know, screw it. Let's buy a 10 unit. Yep. Not in the, not in the greatest area. Okay. If I do say it's right above uh, Marquette park in Chicago lawn. Um, so not in the greatest area. It was kind of during the pandemic as well. Uh, and early in my investing career, I was kind of just looking for cash flow, And I saw this property, just like all these other old brick buildings in the not most desirable areas. You see the 10%, you see the 15% and you get uh, you get wide eyed, you get excited. And then when you actually purchase the building, and get to work in, you realize, Hey, that 15, 10% is looking a lot more like six to 8% because of all the maintenance issues, all the hassle and all the things like that. But I got a heck of a deal on the property. I stayed consistent. Uh, COVID definitely helped me, uh, get a good, good deal. And I actually just recently sold it. So I was able to get out fortunately because, uh, the market turned. So yeah, it was a little bit of a whirlwind there. Uh, first property was quite a, quite a bit for me to take on like that, but I wouldn't change it. It was, it was fun. And I learned a lot. What, was there anything specific that really whacked you upside the head with that property that you, you weren't uh, anticipating? Yes. Uh, I didn't, I, I was not knowledgeable on brickwork, uh, windows, anything along those lines, tuck pointing uh, with section eight tenants. I didn't realize how much you actually um, get uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Mark, can you help me out? It's um when someone comes in and checks out a CHA tenant. Oh, it's just the inspections. Inspection, inspection. Yeah, inspection. Section 8 inspections. That I got nailed on that a couple of times. And just the, obviously we're going through COVID times. So people found out that they don't have to pay rent. And we kind of had to deal with that, just like everyone else, I'm sure. Uh, so just a bunch. It was a huge learning curve. But again, we made it We made it a decent investment. So I was happy the way it ended. So you... You bought that, and I noticed you have been buying stuff in, you know, so they call that C minus uh, D plus type neighborhood, right? Yeah, it's exactly. um, you know, a 125 year old uh, building for the most part, and uh, th there's a lot of people that do that, and they, they see the same things that you see. You, you've shifted away uh, on some of that towards more A, not even B, kind of A and B type stuff. I know you got something in Bolingbrook, uh, uh, maybe call it C plus B minus, but. Uh, what was, was it just all those troubles you just explained or what, what made you make that shift? No, it wasn't the, it wasn't necessarily the troubles. I understood the troubles and I uh, understood that it was kind of a learning curve, 
But I think so early in my investing career, and I say that like I've been investing for 20 years, I haven't. Um, but I was really chasing cash flow at the beginning. And I think that's one of my uh, regrets. And I'm sure we'll talk about this later is if I had to start over and do it all over again, uh, I'd be chasing more of a appreciation, nicer area, something that is a little less hassle because I didn't need the cash flow at the time. So something that would just build up over time, which is why I'm in the Naperville's, I'm looking into Wheaton's, I'm in a nice little pocket in Bolingbrook right now. Um, so I think that's why I'm kind of shifting my focus just because cash flow isn't the most important thing to me right now. I think it's going to be there eventually, as long as I'm not underwater on the building, I'm happy. Got it. No, similar mindset. Like I, I love just thinking of that long-term, right? When, when you talk to, when you hear interviews of the Sam Zells of the world, you know, they're sitting there saying what their net worth is. They're, they're not sitting there saying my cash flow is X. It's important. It's absolute necessity. And for someone who's maybe looking to quit their job and replace it with income, it's great. But otherwise, it's a necessity to keep you alive so you can keep the game going. At, at least that's my view. And again, might not might, might not be right for everyone, but yeah, it, there's definitely a play there. And I feel it doesn't get uh, doesn't get articulated enough. Exactly. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. It's just what you said. It's what works best for me. I'm in it for the long game. I like the properties I have in these A, B areas, and I'm looking forward to see what the future holds with them. Well, let me add one more thing, because I think this is an important fact, and I think you could probably attest to it, is you, you, I referred you to uh, Chase Mark Warriors at Landmark because we didn't have coverage in that area, and you worked with the property manager. I think he's a good property manager. I don't think you had any complaints. But even though he probably handled most of these issues, you still had to be there to verify. You still had to be there to transfer money. You still had to. So a lot of these people buy these turnkey properties that are in these C and D class neighborhoods and thinking, I got a property manager. And even if it's a good property manager, that good property manager still has to bother you for every little thing that, uh, not every little thing, but there's a lot of uh, average size things that you as the owner have to know about. And you still get that, that uh, capacity or your mind taken up by that property, even though you have a good property manager mind. And that's what happens with that C and D class. It, Oh yeah. I spent, I spent more time on this property, even though I wasn't managing it myself and landmark did a great job. They're working their tails on off on it too, but I spent more time on that than I did all my other properties combined. <laughs> so, which I'm sure so many people have the same story. Yep. So we, we move out to, to the burbs and I mean, you're from Naperville, correct? Like that's the, that's yep. the initial yep. stomping grounds. Naperville North high school. Woo. Oh, that's also going to be our Chicago fact. A little teaser. We're going to have, <laughs> We're going to bring back your uh, Max Preps high school playing days here. Oh, gracious. Uh, <laughs> all right. So how are, you know, I think a lot of people are interested in those areas, right? Because they're great areas, great schools. We've had a couple episodes on them. You know, how are you sourcing deals out there? Because I know you, you, you swooped up a couple of things. Like, are you going direct? Are you finding stuff with owners? Are you just beating up the MLS? So let's talk through like acquisition yeah. strategy. So um, my... My three Naperville properties were straight off the MLS. Actually, that's a lie. Uh, two of the Naperville properties were straight off the MLS. I got fortunate. Um, I knew one property extremely well because uh, actually it was my elementary school crush's house growing up. It was right down the, right down the, right down the street from my parents. Um, so I was able to swoop up and buy that one. And then I had a duplex that I was able to work a deal with some people. I, I saw it before everyone else did. Um, my other Naperville property, it was actually my realtor's property. And I saw the potential to add a third bedroom to it. It was a two bed, two bath. And I saw the potential to add a third bed. Mark, you've been in that one. Um, so that's right next to the train station in downtown Naperville. And then my Bolingbrook property was an off-market deal. Uh, I was an older lady who was moving to Iowa with her daughter, just needed to get out. It was in rough shape. So I was able to get that one and do a little value add and refinance my money out. So two off-market, two MLS in the suburbs. And then my 10 unit was also an off market deal. Awesome. So, and then what, what is your involvement right now? So, I mean, you're obviously, you know, we're trying to get recruited. We're, we're trying to get into our eighth season. What is your actual like time allocation per week? You think like honest assessment of, you know, I'm spending X amount of time finding deals. I'm spending X amount of time, you know, maintaining these, these ones I've just purchased. Yeah. Um, it needs to be more, <laughs> but uh, I'd say I spend my mornings. Usually I'm up around like five. I'll usually work on either finding deals, evaluating deals from around five, six thirty-seven. So I'd say probably like probably two to three hours a day is spent looking for deals, evaluating deals, talking to people. And that's just during the weekday. So I'd say probably 10 to 12 hours a week is spent uh, strictly on real estate. Now, hopefully when I retire from the NFL, that number goes up and I'm able to explode this thing a little bit. But right now, that's what I'm comfortable with. 
Got it. No, that's great. That, 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 that's a higher number than I expected. Right. And it's, it's also you putting in the time, right. You're waking up at five to make it happen. Like, um, you, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. That's like, I think that's what makes it the easiest thing. If I hated doing it, I wouldn't do it. Right. Um, so, and I just want to, especially right now in this competitive market, it's hard to find places. So I'm trying to be the first one in, uh, to get my foot through the door and I'm oh I'm oh for a lot this year, uh, in making offers, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I do in a week. You know, it's, uh, finding deals. I always tell people if, if, as long as you're, it's the one kind of stat that if you're 10% or under, uh, you're still doing pretty good <laughs> No doubt, <laughs> as, no doubt. as far as evaluating and finding good stuff. You just get, you just end up building the muscle of evaluating deals and ruling, ruling out the other 90% faster is, is what you're training yourself for right now. And you learn areas. That's the, that's honestly what I'm doing. I know what something rents for an area. I know what something's worth in an area. So you're learning worst case scenario. You're learning. So you've bought the multi in the city, you've bought some scattered, you got a multi in the suburbs. Um, you've, you've done some, re, you've done a few rehabs now, uh, fairly uh, you know, medium sized type rehabs. Mm -hmm. what, 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 are you, what are you really looking at right now? Are you looking just to kind of grow that more of that scattered site? Or are you looking into more development type stuff? So good question. I am looking, I'm continuing to look for rental properties in those kind of A, B plus areas, whether that be single family, duplex, triplex, quad, all those so on and so forth. Obviously those are tough to come by. Um, but I am moving on to getting into private lending. Um, I know a couple flippers, rehabbers, I'm trying to get into some private lending deals. And then I'm starting to dabble in some development deals, kind of where um, you kind of are kind of Kane County area. And also in Naperville, there's a development deal that I'm kind of think going back and forth on. So just trying to dip my toe and see what fits evaluate as many deals as I can. Also, if I can flip a couple of properties to make some money to put back into some more deals, I'd love that as well. Looking at, uh, you know, we're at a weird time right now where we're not sure what's going to happen with uh, Russia. We're not sure with inflation. Uh, we're not sure if this is the start of some kind of downturn. Like what, what type of precautions are, are you taking as far as uh, kind of looking at these larger scale things or even private money? Is there anything that you're nervous about? On the terms of the buy and hold side, I'm not super nervous. If there's a 7% interest rate and the deal works at 7% interest rate, it works. Whether it works at a 3.1% or a 7, doesn't really matter. The deal works for me. So I'm going to get on it. Uh, flipping, I'm a little nervous just because you don't know how the market's going to be with the interest rates. I think the market's going to keep somehow keep going up. But if I have a flip that takes 9, 10 months... And then all of a sudden interest rates go from four to six somehow, obviously it's going to be harder for someone to afford the new property. So flips I'm a little bit more cautious on, but for buy and holds, if the deal works, the deal works for me. Is interest rates, and maybe I ask both of you guys, this is interest rates going to be what's going to kind of curtail uh, rising prices, even in the face of low inventory? Well, Tom, you want to start it off? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, man, like demand is still just so high. Like demand is just so supply and demand is nowhere near rates can go to seven. We, I think we're still going to have a supply shortage, right? It'll help this like craziness of getting, you know, 20 offers all over a list. Like I think it'll help bring it down, but we're just fund The fundamentals are still just so far off and we're not building enough new ones either. So like, I, I just, I, I see like, there's not enough good product on the market. So you mentioned like flipping and like, you never know what's going to happen nine or 10 months, obviously a, a valid concern, but like good product will still, will still be out there. Like there's, there's a lack of good product. Like I feel real good about everything that we're putting on the market. Um, you know, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but supply and demand is completely out of whack. And I also feel like we can't have this crazy runaway inflation for the sole reason that we are a global economy. Right. This is in 1950s where it's just us. Like, if we start having this where, hey, we're going to have to pay someone 100 grand to work at McDonald's, it's like, no, we're going to outsource it. Right. We're going to use technology. We're going to go to India. We're going to go to China. Like, we have these caps that kind of hold our inflation to a certain level. Like, is it, we can't have this crazy runaway inflation. I guess we could, but like, it would just be bonkers if we did. But like, okay. there's all these global pressures that would curtail that to some point if it got, you know, Everyone talks about hey, rates used to be fourteen percent. Like I don't see how that would ever happen because if it did, like it would just destroy middle low class America. Yeah, I think you made a you made a good point with the 
yeah, there's definitely low inventory and good product is still going to sell, but there are, I've been noticing at least on my offer end, there are still competitive offers, but there just aren't as many right now. And we'll see if that picks up in June and may come in here right now. Uh, but yeah, like you said, like inventory is still low, so it's going to stay competitive, but you are, I am seeing, at least on my end, the offers coming down a little bit, less, less people in the game. Well, yeah, well, it used to take, you know, it used to take us 90 days to sell a house on the market, you know, we'd have all these open and now it's like, shit, we went to the second weekend. Is that, are we price wrong? Like, it's like, you know, it's, it's still kind of all, you know, call, you know, all relative, yeah. uh, going, going back to making offers. It has, uh, has the, Hey, do you, do you pull the line? Like, Hey, I played in the NFL. Like, does anyone give a damn? Has it helped you in any way? Or are you just like the rest of us scrounging here? So I keep, that's a phenomenal question. Cause it's actually <laughs> very, this has to do with something that just happened to me recently. So I keep the NFL completely out of everything I do real estate investing wise, it's at least on an offer and selling side of things, because the first thing people think of when you play in the NFL is, Oh, he has money. Mm-hmm. So I might be offering 200,000 on a house. Like, no, we know he can pay 300,000, right? That's the first thought that goes in their head when they know I played eight years in the league, but I never made a huge money. There's a lot of thousand airs in the NFL now. So not all, not all, not all of us are making 10, 20 million. So I try to keep all NFL business, all, all that stuff all to the side. Cause I've noticed it hurts me more than it helps me. Yeah. I, I know when I first got, you know, like you have your proof of funds, your line of credit. Like I used to tell Renovo to put like, put the big, you know, put my max on there. Worst and thing. you know, just to be like, show them I'm serious. And it's like, this is hurting me. Like yeah. put the number they want and that's it. <laughs> like every I put, time. I put like the that exact number. number that I can, that I'm offering right on my pre-approval every single time. Yeah. Nothing more. Yeah. Let me ask this question though. If, is there any opportunity for you in the syndicate spot to group be almost a, a thought leader with your, your coworkers and, and kind of uh, if you guys talked about any of that stuff, as far as pulling the money together. Are you t- you're talking about my teammates? Yes, right? yes, yeah. Co-workers yeah, well, is such a great word there. I was say co- <laughs> you don't have co-workers. I just hear teammates all the time. I was trying to be discreet about him. Did you talk NFL. about your coworker Tom Brady? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he has a couple. He has a couple dollars to put into a deal. I'm sure. Um, but no, it's there's a decent amount of NFL guys who invest in real estate. I know uh, De- Devin Kennard is actually a big real estate investor in Arizona. Uh, Kendrick Bourne invests in Portland, who's a wide receiver for our team but there's not as many as you think there would be, which is, I would love to kind of lead the initiative to get more NFL guys involved in real estate investing. Cause number one, I think it's a great place for them to put their funds and to learn and kind of have a path to go on to their next career. Um, but in terms of actually actively pursuing it, you'd be amazed how many guys are like, no, I just play football. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking for that second and third contract because that's, that's everyone's motivation in the NFL because you don't really make money on your first contract unless you're a first round draft pick. It's that second and third contract where guys are really fighting for. I think about what's that show on HBO uh, with the rock. Um, of course. Yeah. And uh, him, like if he just gathered everyone's money to uh, invest in real estate, like that's like, that's where my mind's like, Hey, that's what I do. If I was like, and now yeah. I can do that. It depends. Some guys mindsets not there, but a lot of guys mindsets are, and they all invest in different places in the country. So We'll see what happens. Hopefully one day we can get it all, all going together. Uh, it's on your shoulders, man. Start a podcast. We got 100%, this. It's 100% my fault <laughs> that we're not doing it, right? <laughs> yeah. So let's let's fast forward. You know, let's say you get another, you know, you get another good five, six years. Like let's, you know, you, you put in your time, but at some point it will be over, right? And, and you're coming back, you know, coming back to DuPage County. And what does that look like? What, you know, where do you see yourself when, when you do the flip and real estate becomes number one priority? Like, do you see yourself as doing these syndications or just, Hey, I'm going to buy, you know, 50 units kind of live off it and call it a day. Like, have you thought that far out? What does it look like? That's a good question. Cause I always teeter the line of how much effort do I want to put in real estate? Cause I absolutely love it. And I see the positives of it. Uh, but I also love my family time and I love going to our lake house. I love fishing, doing all that stuff. So it kind of teeters the line. I would love to get involved with, syndications. I have to learn a lot more about it. And I, again, five years down the road is a long time for me, especially NFL years. That's completely ancient. So I think in the meantime, just going to keep finding real estate deals, hopefully team up with as many good people as I can. I think that's something I struggle with is I have a heart, even though I play on a team, um, just, I haven't had enough time in real estate to really develop a team. I have Mark, I have a bunch of other guys that I can kind of pick their brains on, but I'd love to 
form a partnership with someone I can trust and kind of join these syndication syndications, do these development deals, kind of these bigger properties. Cause I love these single families in Naperville, Bowling, special area in Bolinbrook, um, smaller multifamily, but I'd love to take the next step and go a little bit bigger, but there's a lot to learn. Um, and a lot of time I need to put into it, uh, before I feel comfortable to say, Hey, I'm all in on real estate because obviously I'm still, I'm still in the NFL right now. And that's my main focus. So going back uh, five, six years, starting over kind of your re- real estate journey from figuring out due, due diligence and so forth, like what would you have done differently looking back so far? Yeah. What I said earlier, I would have, I would have invested in the A and B areas from, from the get go. Uh, I took a chance on that uh, 10 unit in a not great area in Chicago. And honestly, it was a, it was a solid building. I probably could have done some things differently and we, we made some decent cash flow and sold it for a profit. Uh, but I think I could have spent my time and my money um, better, I guess is the word, in an a, a or B area. And I think I would have branched out and tried to make a little bit more relationships than I did. Um, I think I have a hard time using my platform sometimes because I hate saying, oh yeah, I play in the NFL. You want to team up? Because I hate using that. But I think people would enjoy hearing that and hearing and joining with someone who kind of has a sports background. Um, so I think just creating more partnerships and investing in more A, B, and area, A, B areas is how I would like to start. When uh, I remember the first time you and me spoke on the phone and me being the trying to find common ground with people, I'm always like, so, so what do you do? And you're like, or you told me like, I live in Boston uh, uh, X amount of months out of the year. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, what do you, what do, you do? What's your background? And you're like, I'm an NFL player. I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, like I felt guilty, like for not like recognizing the name. Oh, <laughs> I'm not a very well-known NFL player. I don't know. It's just like I get, I almost get embarrassed saying it sometimes, if that makes sense. Like I would rather just someone just talk to me just like, because it's me instead of like, because I get sometimes people only want to talk to me because I'm an NFL player when really I'd rather just have them talk to me because it's, because it's me. Yeah, no, that, 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 makes that, sense. that makes sense. It makes sense, man. I see a lot of opportunity though, right? Because it's not like you're just some guy in the NFL, like out there, like you're doing it. Right. Like you were, you're out there making offers, doing your, you're scrounging just like the rest of us here. Amen. And like, I mean, like there's, there's proof in the pudding. If you're not willing to do it, you're not going to succeed at this. Like you have to, just because you might have a little more money in the bank or come from quote unquote, like a very high professional background doesn't mean you don't have to scrounge and get your hands dirty and go to work as well. So if you don't do that, I don't think you're going to be successful. If you haven't read into Magic Johnson's kind of uh, post sports career outside of disease and stuff like that, but uh, if you haven't read into like his real estate ventures, like he he really found a way to leverage those relationships to to be the he's a real estate magnet now. I would call it. I think he owns a couple of sports teams or part of a couple of sports teams so far. So like he's really leveraged it. He'd probably be a good guy for you to re- research if you haven't. Yeah, read I've, it. I I just found that out right now. So I'd love to. I love Magic Johnson. So that'd be awesome. Matt, do you see yourself, what else do you see nationally outside of Chicago? Like, do you say like, Hey, this is my hood. I think I'm going to stay here locally. Have you started to look at other areas or, you know, where's your head at around that space? So I think locally right now is where I'm at. I've been trying to get in Northwest Indiana in all honesty, a little bit as well. Uh, super competitive lately there. Uh, tried a couple deals, lost a couple offers. Uh, Honestly, the southern, I was in Boston for three years. We bought a condo out there and kind of flipped it, lived in it, and then sold it off this year. Um, but I was searching for multifamily out in the sub, like the Foxborough, North Attleboro um, areas of Boston and Massachusetts. And I think that's an awesome area that I need to look into a little bit more. And I made a couple offers while I was out there as well during the season and unfortunately didn't, didn't get those. But I think the southern suburbs of Boston are awesome, especially anywhere around Foxborough, obviously, obviously the Patriots. Um, and then Northwest Indiana, I've been trying to get into as well. It's crazy. Boston's houses are 100 years older than ours. <laughs> yeah. No, and they're, they're super cool, too. It's like yeah. it's like there's and there's some pockets in the Boston area, too, where it's not like super, super old uh, houses or you get one that is totally like been like as long as the mechanicals are um, kind of turned around and flipped a little bit, you'll be good. Like the houses will usually be smaller and everything, but there's some sneaky areas outside of Boston and rent prices have shot through the roof there this year. Um, just like a lot of places in the country, but it's a sneaky area. 
Yeah, I saw a house, uh, 1772, and it was one of the northern suburbs of, of uh, Mass Boston in Massachusetts, but uh, probably around the Harvard area, right? Yeah, that's like literally before like this country started officially. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool, like it's a bunch of history. I loved living there, and um, there's a bunch of real estate people out there who do some awesome work. All right, awesome. All right, Tom, anything else? Let's wrap it. All right, Matt, you ready? Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So as a real estate investor, what is your competitive advantage? I think just what we talked about, just the work ethic that comes with being a, being a professional. Like I know what it takes to be successful in a line of work. And then once I'm retired and done with the NFL, I think just the willingness to get grimy and uh, get down and get stuff done is kind of what my competitive advantage is. Oh, I love get grimy. There's a softball team we play against called grime. I think it's a great name. <laughs> softball team. <laughs> And their name is Grime. And I was like, oh, we should have named ourselves that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. Uh, what is one piece of advice you would tell someone that has yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Do what I didn't. Go network. Go uh, <laughs> go meet with people. Um, I pretty much just called Mark off Google. I Googled product managers and then called Mark and he's been a great resource. Uh, but go network and meet with as many people as you can. Try to form a team, whether it be an attorney, realtor, property manager. Honestly, that's the best thing uh, you can do. Because if you haven't bought a property yet, your knowledge is so far behind everybody else's. And I don't think that's something that just books and podcasts and YouTube videos can make up for. You actually have to get firsthand knowledge from people. So I'd say network. Knowledge and take action. The dichotomy. All right. What do you do for fun? Uh, fish a bunch. Uh, love to love to go around the Bass Lakes around here. We have a lake house up in Michigan, which I love going to. I have a little 18 month old, so him running around, run around the backyard, do as much stuff as we can with him. Uh, and then I'm a big uh, I'm a big sport card collector. So love love Ooh. collecting sports cards. I have my own sports card page, so I spend a bunch of time on that. So that's kind of what that's kind of my my little side hobby. Uh, we got to talk, man. I just recently got back into that. Uh, I was, uh, that was kind of my hustle as a teenager, selling baseball cards and doing baseball card shows or small call sports me, ones. Call me anytime. I have a quite the collection behind me. Nice. I know in my parents' house, they still have the old Beckett's I used to have. So you get yep, that yep. pricing. The old Beckett. <laughs> yep. pricing. There's a different way to price them these days. Yep. <laughs> nope. I only go to the old school Beckett. <laughs> and you, and you we'll wait for it to come out every month. Uh, I remember. Yeah. 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 It's cool. It's an awesome hobby. I love it. What, what is a good book? podcast or self-development activity that you'd recommend to our listeners? Oh, wasn't, pre wasn't prepared for this. Um, honestly, the bigger pockets books are a good place to start. If anyone has any ideas, uh, wants to just get started and everything, Brandon Turner, how to invest in real, how to invest in real estate. Uh, everyone does the Kiyosaki rich dad, poor dad. I think that's just a good mindset book. Uh, I'd be wrong if I didn't plug this podcast and say, especially if you're in the Woo! Illinois area, listen to this podcast, the bigger pocket, bigger pockets podcasts are solid. Um, and just research anyone who comes on here and gives a suggestion for a book, write it down and put that in your own personal library and take the time to read it. That's right. Appreciate the call. Now we're going to say we're endorsed by the NFL and the new England oh, yeah. Patriots. There we go. <laughs> Love it. All right. Besides yourself, name one person in your local network that you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Outside of Mark Ainley himself, um, honestly, Bebek Doss, the Doss Law has helped me a bunch. Just uh, He's been great. Again, another guy that Mark connected me with, and he's been great to work with, super responsive and super intelligent. Um, so I think Bebek Doss has been just awesome for my real estate business. He is so responsive. I always ask him a question. How the hell are you doing like actual attorney work? Because you're always I was, like, in, so I was in Mexico. I was in Mexico last year. He's calling me on a Saturday. It's just like talking about the week. I was just like, I was like, hey, go spend time with your family. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 17, by the way. He was a, an OG for us. Yeah, he's yeah. A, and then he's you, a, you work with, uh, we'll do the shout out Josh Mitchell too. I know you do deals with him. He was episode 101. Yep. Josh is, I love Josh too. He's awesome. So Matt, thank you so much. You provide a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Honestly, if you are in the area and like doing deals, like talking real estate, just reach out to my, probably the best way to, without me actually giving my personal phone number would be just my Instagram page. Uh, shoot me a DM over there. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, it's an awesome name. It's Maddie Lack 11. It was created in my sophomore year of college. I was number 11. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's probably the best way to reach me and see if we can 
put something together. Awesome. Uh, All right, Mark, who do we got for the, uh, for a potential hundred dollars here for the Chicago uh, fact? This is, this is a real name for anyone that's over 40. will think this is a joke. Juan Valdez. Um, oh. it was, it was, I don't know if you guys remember the coffee commercials. It used to be Juan Valdez. Maybe I'm the old one here. <laughs> <laughs> but Juan Valdez on a clearing. He bought uh, a, a straight up Chicago investor t-shirt. So. All right. So I had to go to max preps for this one. We're going to go back to, uh, we're going to see how, how well Mark knows the, uh, the local high schools here. And I can't remember, I think you went to Addison, so I don't think this was in your conference. So hope, we'll see what you get this. But anyways, so Matt led Naperville North to the 8A quarterfinals his senior year, for those who didn't know. And Matt, you can't answer this, let Mark do it. But their last high school win came against this local high school, whose mascot is the Dukes. And I'll give you multiple choice, unless you know this already. Go ahead, give me the mic. I don't All know. Right. <laughs> their, their mascot is the Dukes. Is it A, Maine South, B, York, C, Min- Minoka? Or D, Conan? Uh, not Conan. It's, it's not Conan. Um, oh, geez. I, I... Known for their cross-country legacy. You got taking a, a, what was my second option? <laughs> yeah, Maine, South, York, uh, Manuka, or Conan? Uh, York. The York Dukes. Am, am, I, am I right, by the way, Matt? I'm looking this up for yeah. Max Preps. You're right. You are Woo! right. That was my – that last game in the quarterfinal was crazy. Yeah, but, York uh, York was in my conference. They were right there out of Elmhurst, York, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. See, you should have gotten that. So you, you won $100 there, right? That was, that was kind of like anticlimactic. There was a lot of heaven and hawing. No, no. I actually <laughs> – wow, I was trying to picture all the different – I, I know I, I know all their football fields. And, like, I remember just, like, I was trying to picture, like, the, uh, never mind. Whatever. Like, awesome. All right, dude. Juan Valdez. I forgot to <laughs> say that it's sponsored by um, Renovo. So you get a hundred dollar gift card for uh, being in for purchasing something on the Straight Chicago Investor website. Awesome. Well, dude, awesome show, Matt. Thank you very much for coming on, Tom. Thank you as always, listeners. Head over to the Straight Up Chicago Investor uh, merchandise store. Grab a T-shirt. Grab a hat. I think you could even. Uh, if you're still protective, you got a face mask straight up Chicago, or, or we got baby bibs talking about uh, oh, yeah. uh, babies here a little. So um, grab that and you can enter it in the drawing to win a hundred dollars if I get the question right. So Matt, thank you very much. Tom, yep. thanks always. And listeners, we'll see you next week. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks all.